Hello everybody, I'm Raphael Perry, and this time I'm going to be investigating the old Blood Sword series of game books. Now Blood Sword was a series by Dave Morris and Oliver Johnson, I know that because it says it right here. And I have some dodgy PDF scans off the internet which are fairly easy to find. Now Blood Sword's a bit of a fun one because I initially only thought there were four books, and this is because the only book I ever owned a physical copy of was the third book. Uh, I picked it up in the early 90s, played it a bit once or twice with my friends, loved it to bits, uh, played it quite a few more times. I think at one point I even wrote my little brother into a playthrough. Um, I liked the tactical combat, and it was quite funky and fun. However, I enjoyed it most for solo play, and I always wished I'd got hold of the first one or two books. In fact, I enjoyed it so much that about seven or eight years later, no, maybe nine years later, I extrapolated the leveling tables for the four character classes all the way down to one and all the way up to twenty, uh, in, with the possible intent of creating a full-blown role-playing game from it, because it does feel like a, a more well-rounded role-playing system. And... I, I was tempted to try a sort of... Um, <laughs> uh, play-by-mail editing, uh, uh, sort of campaign, uh, sort of like kingdom management campaign, like a sort of civilization kind of game where each, each player would start with four characters, one of each class at level one, and a mud hut, and they'd have to expand and build up from there. Yeah. Because uh, cause that's fun, right? I uh, didn't really go anywhere, I, I didn't get enough people interested, and um, I didn't really choose to develop it any further. I'm just going to check this is recording. Yep, well good, and that probably looks like a right nightmare. Don't worry, there's something nice down there. So. This episode is going to be more of a meet the heroes episode. We're highly unlikely to get into combat in this actual episode because unlike many other game books, well, Tunnels and Trolls aside, the preamble in this one is rather lengthy. But let's dive in, shall we? Uh, so I'm not going to go reading through all the leveling tables and I might skip a lot of the class skills and abilities and just come back to them later. Hopefully that'll be all right. So, welcome to the world of Bloodsword. Your world is the magical land of legend. In legend, there are many kinds of adventurer, each with unique skills and techniques for dealing with creatures of the supernatural. Those who rely on a good sword and the strength of their right arm are called warriors. The practitioners of the magical arts are called enchanters, with many deadly spells already at their fingertips. Sages are a class of ascetic monks, wise in ancient lore, but also skillful in the use of the quarterstaff, bow, and unarmed martial arts. Lastly, there are tricksters. They are swift and dexterous swordsmen, but their true forte is for use of stealth, guile, and cunning to achieve their ends. I'm going to skip that because it's kind of redundant. For your adventure in the Krafian battle pits, you may take a single hero or put together a group of adventurers. If playing alone, you take a single hero of one of the four adventuring classes, warrior, enchanter, sage, or trickster. You will be on your own, but with the advantage that you are of a higher rank, that is, individually more powerful than you would be in a group of adventurers. A solitary adventurer undertaking this adventure will be of eighth rank. If there are two players, each takes the persona of a fourth rank adventurer. These two must belong to different adventuring classes. Ideally, they will be chosen so that one of the adventurer's strengths will make up for the other's weaknesses. An enchanter is physically not very powerful, for example, while a warrior has little resistance to sorcery, so a combination of these two classes makes a strong team. If the adventure is undertaken by three players, each takes a third rank character, while in a team of four players, each has a second rank character. Again, all characters must be of different classes. These preconditions can be summarized as follows. We've just read it, I don't need to read that. 
After reading the sections on combat, magic, and teamwork, you should decide how many players will be taking part, and to which of the four adventuring classes each player will belong. Each player will read only the special section for the class to which he or she belongs, generally because they don't need to know the stuff for the other classes, although I would generally advise everyone be familiar with how the Sage's healing works, in case the Sage player completely forgets to use it. It's a very useful ability that basically keeps people alive. Terminology. The usual role-playing abbreviation is used to indicate different dice rolls. This uses the basic format of X dice plus Y, meaning that X dice are rolled and Y is added to the total. As an example, 2 dice plus 3 means roll 2 dice and add 3, giving a number from 5 to 15. Taking another case, 1 die minus 1 means roll 1 die and subtract 1, Negative numbers count as zero unless otherwise stated, so this would give a score from zero to five. Fighting prowess, etc. Apparently it's the most important stat because it needs to be in the title. They could have just called it attributes or abilities or something. <laughs> Each character is described by four attributes. These are fighting prowess, a measure of how powerful a fighter the character is. Psychic ability an indicator of the character's resistance to attack spells, and, in the case of the Enchanter, his or her aptitude for magic. Awareness, a difficult concept, as it encompasses quickness of thought, dexterity, and general nous. Not that difficult as far as concepts go, then. Endurance, the attribute measuring the character's state of health. Wounds are deducted from endurance, and if it reaches zero, then the character dies. Combat. You'll notice we've had a very brief introduction on like the first page, and we're straight into rules here. This is a very rules-heavy set of game books, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. Combat takes place in rounds, each of which represents about 10 seconds of action. Each round, everyone who is taking part in the combat gets the opportunity to perform one action, if he or she wishes, to attack, cast a spell, or whatever. Actions are taken in sequence based on each combatant's awareness score. The combatant with the highest awareness acts first, then the combatant with the next highest awareness, and so on. Combatants with equal awareness scores act simultaneously. A combatant who is... they love the word combatant, don't they? A combatant who is killed, slain, has perished, reduced to zero endurance before his turn, does not get to act because he is dead. These are the possible combat options, and the circumstances in which they may be used. A character may choose any option from which he or she I for which he or she is eligible, eligible as his or her action for the round. Move. This action allows the character to close and fight an enemy, or to move to an exit, if any. If you take the move option while an opponent is fighting you, then, unless your awareness is higher than the opponent's, you take an automatic wound. Once all surviving characters in the party have moved to an exit, the party may flee at the start of the next round. Now, this is a very simplistic move system. You're basically like a yo-yo. You're in combat or you're out of it. You are standing on the edge of the combat area, or right in there in the thick of it, up against a foe. There's no option to just move to a space of your choice on the battle map. That's unfortunate, and it's something I need to remember, as I will probably be wanting to adopt a much more flexible move system, say I want to walk over here and do this. Fight. Hang on. The move option allows a character to close and fight. Does that mean that the fight action is then part of the move action? I don't believe it does, actually. It seems to just be move up. Just get close to fight. Um, let me know if you disagree down in the comment section down below. I mean, it's there. You know, you might as well use it. Fight! Sorry. Fight! <laughs> the character must have previously chosen the move option in order to close it to be close enough to an opponent to fight. But there are exceptions to this rule. Sometimes the tactical maps in the text will show that your opponents are directly adjacent to you at the start of combat, in which case an immediate attack is possible. Great. Defend. 
You cannot attack in a round in which you choose this option, but it has the advantage of, make, of making you harder to hit. This is explained more fully below. Great, we'll get to it then. Shoot. This is an option for sages and tricksters only. You fire an arrow at any one opponent. Unlike the fight action, you do not have to move first because, of course, arrows are long-range weapons. You cannot choose to shoot if an opponent is striking at you in the same round, but it is... That is, you must dispose of any opponents who are close, who have closed to attack you before picking off others with your bow. And finally, flee! FLEE FOR YOUR LIVES! <laughs> Sometimes the text will give your party the option to flee from a fight. All surviving adventurers must have taken a move before the party can flee. When this option is taken, the entire party flees at the start of the round, so that their opponents get no chance to hack at them or cast spells as they run off. Call a spell to mind and or cast a spell in mind. These are options for enchanters only. They are explained in the special rule section on enchanters. You can perform one of these actions in each round. Tricksters sometimes get the opportunity for two actions a round though, as explained later in their special rules. I'd actually forgotten that, I'll have to go look it up. The rules for combat are designed for ease of play but require a short explanation. When striking at an opponent, that is, when you take the fight option for a round, you roll two dice. A score of equal to or lower than your fighting prowess means that your blow has hit. If you hit, you roll a damage die, or dice if higher ranks, to see how much of an endurance loss you have inflicted. If your opponent has an armor rating, you must reduce your die roll for damage by this amount, and the result, if greater than zero, is deducted from your opponent's endurance. Take an example. If you have a fighting prowess of seven and a damage roll of one die, you are attacking a troll whose fighting prowess is six and who also rolls one die for damage. That's a rather weedy troll. You have the higher awareness, so you get first blow. Rolling two dice, you score a three. This is less than your fighting prowess score, so you have succeeded in hitting it. Next, you roll one die for the damage your blow inflicts. You get a six, but the troll has an armor rating of two so only four points are deducted from its endurance. That armor rating of two wasn't mentioned previously in the example, so, um, okay. That's, uh, suddenly his armor has been introduced. To be fair, it wasn't as relevant earlier, but it would have been useful to set up the information in advance. If still alive, that is, if it hasn't yet been reduced to zero endurance, the troll now gets to hack back at you. It rolls six on two dice, equal to its fighting prowess, so good enough to hit you, though only just... For its damage die, roll it scores a 1, meaning you have an armor rating because you have an armor rating of 2, that means that you lose no endurance. The troll's claws hit you, but scrape harmlessly off your studded leather jerkin. The battle rages on for another round. Again, this armor rating could have possibly been mentioned a little earlier, but glad to know about it now. Also, God, I wish my dice were this lucky. <laughs> Two other factors need to be considered. If you defend, then your opponent must roll equal to or less than his fighting prowess on three dice in order to hit you. Yes, not two dice, but three, making it basically harder. You do not get to strike a blow in this round in the round you are defending. Now, I may make judicious use of the defense action as and when it's needed. Um, it depends on how my heroes do, really. The other point concerns the move option. If you have a high awareness and can move away from an opponent before that opponent gets his or her action for that round, all well and good. If you try to move away from an opponent who has already attacked you earlier in the round, however, then he or she immediately gets a second hit at you, and this is an automatic hit! For this reason, it is usually best to dispose of one opponent before you move to engage another. You will start your adventure with a suit of armour. This gives you an armor rating of 3 if you are a warrior, or 2 if you belong to one of the other adventuring types. Your armor protects you in combat by absorbing its armor rating from any damage you would otherwise take. For instance, if a monster rolls 2 dice plus 1 for damage and gets a total of 13, then it's maxed its damage roll. 
varies the number of endurance points you would lose if you were not armoured. If you are wearing armour with an armour rating of 2, you would take only 11, that is 13 minus 2 points of damage. You cannot wear two suits of armour in combination. Thus, if you lose your armour and later on come across two breastplates of armour rating 1, say, then you could put on one breastplate, but you could not put on both and claim an armour rating of 2. Yeah. Because, I mean, layered armour is a thing, historically, you know, you'd have your, your padding, then your mail, then your plate. But, for the simplicity of a role-playing system, you want a simple like this is the armour I'm wearing, and that's totally fine, right? And in the context of a gamebook, certainly works well enough. Weapons. If you lose your weapon, you must reduce your fighting prowess and unarmed damage rolls by two until you find a replacement. At 8th rank, Warrior normally has a fighting prowess of 9 and rolls 3 dice plus 1 for damage when he or she hits an opponent. If he or she were to lose his or her sword and be forced to fight barehanded, he or she would have a fighting prowess of 7 and 3 dice minus 1 for damage rolls. Special Character Options With only one player, the adventurer works just like a standard gamebook. With parties of two or more players, one player is the reader, and he or she reads aloud the sections of the book as the adventure progresses. Sometimes there will be an option for a character of a given class to act, for example. If there is a trickster in the party, turn to... Da -da 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 -da. If such an option is taken, only the player concerned looks at the appropriate section. He or she will usually read out that section to the other players, but sometimes part of the section will be restricted and printed in bracketed italics. This means that the player can, if he or she wishes, keep that part of the information withheld from the other players. For instance, there might be an option for a sage to read an ancient piece of parchment. The book passes to the sage player, who reads in his or her restricted section, You decipher the faded runes on the parchment. It tells you that the safe route to the emblem of victory lies beyond the golden door. Turn to 559. The player must tell his or her companions that he or she is reading the parchment, but he or she is not obliged to tell them what it says. In a situation where two or more players are both given the chance for individual action, say the sage could speak to a demon or the trickster could shoot it with an arrow, the players roll dice and the highest score decides who acts. Encounters At all times, players must specify their battle order. The best way is to prepare two, three, or four card counters labelled first player, second player, and so on. Each player then holds the counter, referring to him or her. Battle order may be changed, that is, the counters exchanged, at any time except when in combat. Obviously, battle order makes no difference when only one person is playing. He or she must be the first player. But in parties of two or more, it may be crucial. Generally, but not always, the first player being in the front will be the one to get hit by surprise attacks and so on. If players cannot agree on a battle order, then they must adopt the following standard arrangement. First warrior, then sage, then enchanter, then trickster. That's not an entirely bad... Or obviously these are also cleric, fighter, magic, user, thief. You know, these are standard role-playing classes. Let's not got that wrong, okay? Encounters, fights that is, are almost always played out on a tactical display of a room, corridor, or what have you. An example is shown here. And here we have a map, battle map. It says bronze door, wooden door, two flea options. Uh, probably let's flee through the bronze door, flee through the wooden door. Uh, monster, 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 one, two, three, four. And whether this grey thing is here, these black things, walls, tunnel, you know. The numbers on this tactical map show where the adventurers are standing at when the combat starts. The M's refer to the monster's starting locations. It is possible to fight a monster only in an adjacent square, not across a diagonal, and it is not possible to move on to a square already occupied by a monster or another player. When a monster or character is slain, remove that counter from the map. In other words, you can step over or even stand on a fallen foe. You cannot move where there are no squares, nor onto a blacked out square, which represents an obstacle such as in the map above, a pillar or a large statue. Shaded squares, that'd be these ones, can be moved through by monsters, but not by players. 
In the map above, for instance, the shaded squares indicate a bed of coals which the monsters are immune to. Unless otherwise stated, a monster will always move to attack the nearest adventurer. To find out who the nearest adventurer is, count the number of squares the monster would have to pass through using straight line moves, not diagonals, to reach a position where it could fight. In the diagram below, uh, this one, Let's see, in the diagram below, Adventurer 1 is closer to the monster than Adventurer 2. 1, 2, 1, 2, 3. And the same distance as Adventurer 3. 1, 2, or 1, 2, or 1, 2. Yeah. If several adventurers are equidistant from a monster, roll dice to determine which player the monster will go for. The lowest roll is the unfortunate target of its attention. A similar role must be made when a monster is adjacent to more than one adventurer to see which of them it will fight. Uh, rather than rolling multiple dice, I think I'll just roll like a d3 or d2 or however many adventurers are equidistant. Before starting the adventurer, prepare a few card counters to represent adventurers and monsters. You don't need many, and you will rarely encounter more than three or four monsters at a time. I mean, like, this could literally be played on a chessboard. You know, it, it's a very simple grid system. Always make note of a monster's remaining endurance if you flee from it. Monsters sometimes give chase, and if they catch up with you, then you'll need to know how many wounds you've already inflicted. Encumbrance. There is a limit of how much you can carry. As shown on the character sheet, you can usually have 10 items at a time. If you are fully encumbered and find another item you want, you must discard one of your items you are already carrying, or give it to another player, in order to make space for it in your backpack. Two special points need to be made. A quiver, available to sages and tricksters, will hold up to six arrows. The quiver counts as one item for encumbrance purposes, regardless of the number of arrows it contains. That is, if you have a quiver containing six arrows, then it still counts as one item and not as seven items. Your money pouch counts as one item too. As with the quiver, the contents are not relevant. The money pouch will hold a maximum of a hundred coins of any type, but whether it is full or empty, it counts as only one item. Uh, one moment, please, I need to use my inhaler. <coughs> Magic is the special province of enchanters and, to a much lesser extent, sages. The way in which magic functions for these classes is fully set out in their special sections, see pages 23 to 27. But there is one thing that every adventurer must know about magic. There are two types of magic. Blasting spells simply inflict damage when they are cast, and if you happen to be the target, there is not much you can do about it. You deduct the damage the spell does, less your armor rating, from your endurance score. The other sort of spells are psychic spells, and these you can try to resist. To resist, to resist a psychic spell, you must roll two dice and obtain a score equal to or less than your psychic ability score. If you make this roll, the spell fails to work against you. You will always be told whether a spell is of the psychic or blasting variety. Experience points are a measure of a character's skill and power. If you complete the Battle Pits of Craft successfully, you will be awarded a number of experience points to be divided among all surviving characters. At the same time, you add up any special bonus awards or penalties you were given during the adventure. Your total experience points, the total experience points a character accumulates will enable him or her to rise in rank. As far as I am aware, at the end of each book, there are at least in the first three books, no bonus experience points or penalty experience points, and you're always given exactly enough for each character to rise one rank in a four rank party. In a one rank party, you get, you know, it, it, it's basically enough to keep, so they start with um, the same amount, and they, 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 you basically get a level at the end of a book, essentially. Um, I mean, let's see, it goes from two to three. Uh, 
which would mean rank 12 in the second book for a solo hero, rank 16 for a solo hero in the... Oh, so it might go up to... Because I've discovered there's a book 5. Yeah, okay. The overall experience points needed for each rank are set out below. There we go. We. They aren't relevant during the adventure, but after the adventure they matter. You start the adventure with the base level experience points for your rank, 250 if you are second rank, 500 if you are third, and so on. If you play through the adventure with a single 8th rank character and receive an award of 1000 experience points, for example, because that's how much it gives you at the end of the book, then you will advance to 12th rank. If you had the same award as a party of 4 second rank characters, each character would advance to 3rd rank. After successfully completing the adventure and totting up your experience points, keep the character sheet. Characters who emerge alive from the battle pits are eligible for Blood Sword 2, the Kingdom of Weird. Getting killed. It can happen. If you are playing the adventure solo and your character gets killed, reduced to zero endurance, you do the same thing as you would with any other gamebook. Get a new character and start again at the beginning. But if you are playing as a team and one person gets killed, the other players go on with the adventure. Their party is now re at a reduced strength because of the loss of a character, but they still have a chance to win. The player whose character has kill was killed does not have to sit on the sidelines, however. He now gets to roll the dice for the monsters. He can also change a monster's strategy if he wishes, though he cannot invent powers for it that are not listed in the description. Getting killed can thus be quite fun. You lose your character, but at least you get to give your former companions a hard time. You go, I'm going to go pick on you. You're not the nearest hero, but you are the most vulnerable. You know, things like that. The solo team option. I can reveal at this point that I will be taking the solo team option because I quite like it. Normally, the number of players in the party will be equal to the number of players, the idea being that most people with their hands full just running one adventurer with all his various special skills. However, once you have gained some experience of the Blood Sword system, you may like to try using the solo team option. Under this alternative system, one reader takes not a single character, but an entire team of four characters. In other words, it is just the same as if there were four players, but all the characters are run by the same person, which means they're highly more likely to cooperate and work together well. They are still just second rank, of course. You can't take a team of four eight-rank heroes. Now, I like the solo team option because I like having all of the character-specific options available during the adventure so that I can pick and choose and say, I'd like this guy to do that this time, or, or, or this chap, or this girl gets this option. Let's explore that this time. This does mean, of course, that I have to play with rather weedy characters to begin with, but hey, it happens. Uh, special sections. The following sections contain the detailed rules. I'm going to skim over these a little bit because we don't want to drag on too much longer before getting to the actual adventure. For each adventuring type. You should ideally read only the section that applies to your character, though. Of course, if you're using the solo team option, then you will need to know the powers of several different character types. For convenience, during play that is, so you do not need to keep flipping back and forth, feel free to make photocopies of these special sections and the character sheets. Oh, I'm, I'm getting an idea now. Right. <laughs> the warrior! He's going to come out to play. Apparently, it's really important. Some idiot's going to be clinking bottles together and it'll be famous forever. Sort of. A little bit. Maybe. Not very much. I don't know. You are the master of the fighting arts. You have better fighting prowess than any other adventuring type at the same rank, and when you strike a blow, you inflict more damage. You also have chainmail armor, which provides an armor rating of three, better than the armor available to other characters. Historically, nobody called it chainmail until around the... 1800s. They just called it mail. It was mail. That's what it was. Chain mail is a Victorian invention as far as terminology goes, or possibly late Georgian, early Victorian. It's not really a historically accurate term, although historically people wouldn't differentiate that much between mail, ring mail, scale mail. Uh, ring mail's terrible, by the way, but we'll get to that in a bit. 
These advantages give you a real edge in any fight, but you do not get things all your own way. You have none of the other characters' special skills, the Sage's ESP for instance, or the Trickster's low devious cunning. Also, because you are of noble birth and follow the honourable traditions of your ancestors, you must be careful to stay true to the code of chivalry. You may take an experience point penalty if you behave in a dishonourable, cowardly or uncouth manner. Your attributes at various times are these. Uh, you begin with three items that you should also note down. These are a sword, chainmail armour and money pouch. Now, for the purpose of this playthrough, I'm going to call it Chainmail for the simplicity's sake of differentiating between other armor types. The money pouch contains 10 gold pieces if you are second rank, 15 gold pieces if you are third rank, 20 gold pieces if you are fourth rank, and so on up to 40 gold pieces if you are eighth rank. Regardless of its contents, the pouch still counts as one item for encumbrance purposes. That has already been covered in There's Your Warrior character sheet. At this point, I will reveal that I did a little preparation before recording this video. Oh look, we have some heroes! And here is our warrior, Marius the Warrior. He has a fighting prowess of 8, because he is rank 2 with 250 experience points. A fighting prowess of 8, a psychic ability of 6, his damage dealt is 1d6 plus 1. His awareness is 6, he has an endurance of 12, and an armor rating of 3 as his sword, his chainmail, and a money pouch with 10 gold pieces. Yes, I, I spent about half an hour to three quarters of an hour hunting down decent quality images. Couldn't quite find what I was looking for for the sage. But hey, also, Gavin the Trickster may need a name change at some point, because it doesn't quite feel right. Okay, the Trickster! So adventurers are not honest, chivalrous, and oh right, yes. So the reason I went with this image is because in book three, when the party head out to Utrimer, I'm going to call it Outrimer, right? I'm going to call it Outrimer so much. Although historically, Utrimer is what the French, the medieval French, called the Holy Lands. They literally called it Utrimer. Um, so the world of legend is very much in keeping with the historical medieval European period, right? As a setting, it's quite recognisable. Uh, when the heroes do go to Utrimer, the warrior can meet up with a group of um, holy knights who they come across as crusaders or templars or maybe like even a mercenary unit, but when he meets them and interacts with them, it's very obvious that he's very much a crusader knight type character. The trickster is obviously a sort of Robin Hood scoundrel type character. The sage is basically a medieval friar but with some armor on. I couldn't find good friar art, okay? I really couldn't. It was quite disappointing. And the enchantress is wearing silver armor which is not very practical, probably not going to work at all, and was hard to find something that looked roughly similar. But I'll go with this. Right. So yes, some adventurers are honest, chivalrous, and honourable. Not you. You're basically a rogue. A likeable rogue, perhaps, but a rogue nonetheless. You live by your wits. If you can win a fight by trickery or by shooting someone in the back, you will. Cunning is your main weapon. But when you have to face someone in a straight fight, you are no pushover. After the warrior, you are perhaps the best fighter in any party. Your attributes at various ranks are as follows. Yeah. The rogue actually has the same health level as the warrior. Slightly lower fighting prowess, much higher awareness, the rogue tends to go first. And the damage is basically only slightly worse than the warrior damage. You begin with five items that you should also note down. These are a sword, studded leather armour with an armour rating of two, a money pouch, a bow and a quiver. As we can see here, I've listed all of those. I've also listed armor ratings on the hero tokens. The money pouch contains the same amount of money as everyone else. These rules apply to you. Dodging technique. You are very adept at, at evading attacks. When an opponent makes a fight roll against you, he or she, or it, must roll two dice plus one instead of the usual two dice. And I'm going to be reasonable and say that if you're defending, that's three dice plus one. 
instead of the usual free dice because that's just an obvious extrapolation. Archery. As long as you have your bow and arrows, you can use the shoot option in combat. You do not have to be in an adjacent square to your opponent in order to shoot. A shoot roll is just like a fight roll. That is, to hit, you must roll equal to or under your fighting prowess on two dice. Regardless of your rank, arrows inflict only one die of endurance damage, less armor rating, on the target. Meaning, arrows are best used against low armor foes and also with a limited amount of arrows you want to manage them carefully and spread them out right you don't want to waste them all or use more than one go quick thinking once in each combat you can use this ability to take two actions in the same round the first action happens at the point in the round when you would normally get to act that is as governed by your awareness the second action comes at the end of a round when everyone else has had a chance to do something Now, this could potentially be used to defend, be very hard to hit, and then attack at the end of a round. It could be used to move and attack, to attack then move, you know, all, all manner of things. There's lots of options, so we'll just bear that in mind. You, you could obviously just attack twice, but that's, you, you could even shoot then move, or move out of combat with a lower... Yeah, you could literally run away from someone, turn around and shoot them in the face before they have a chance to, well, after they've had a chance to follow you up, but you, you could move out of combat, the warrior could move in and engage the foe, then you could shoot the person you retreated from. You know, it's very flexible. The Sage. Your upbringing has been at the Spartan Monastery of Illumination on the barren island of Caxos. There, you studied the Mystic Way, a series of demanding psionic disciplines and rigorous physical training. So, our sage also has a fighting prowess of seven. He has a psychic ability of seven, unlike the trickster and the warrior, deals the same amount of damage as the trickster, has slightly less endurance, and the same armor rating. He is equipped with a quarterstaff, ringmail armor. Okay, so ringmail is really bad, right? Uh, Unlike normal mail, whoever whoever links into link either in a four into one standard European pattern or a five into one Indian, Chinese, and Japanese pattern, which is interesting. With ring mail, the rings are just sewn onto a backing, right? Like a, a padded vestment or something. They they don't connect to each other in any way. I mean, sometimes they're sewn together so that they touch at the edges, but they don't link through each other. This is a lot weaker. It's easy for links to be smashed and broken off the backing, and there's it, it, it's not as... Um, I'm not even sure if it historically existed. As, you know, there's a lot less evidence for it, essentially. It's like the poor man's mail. Um, there were some really nice illustrations of ringmail in some of the old Lone Wolf books by Gary Chalk and um, oh, that artist who took over from him around book 8 uh, for, for, for books 8 and 9 it actually looked like Gary Chalk was still doing the artwork but then the guy started going more to his own style for book 9 and 10 and yeah anyway so here is our sage and then of course uh, let's see Several special rules apply to the sage. Archery. As long as you have your bow and arrow, so that is exactly the same as the rogue. Quarterstaff technique. Your expertise in quarterstaff fighting includes a knowledge of critical nerve points. When attacking with the staff, you can elect to make your fight roll on three dice instead of two. This is obviously more difficult, but it means that if you do hit a foe, an extra one die damage and... If... Uh, means that if you do hit, you inflict an extra one die of damage and knock your foe off balance, causing them to take their action at the end of the following round. That is as if they had an awareness score of one. So it doesn't affect them in the current round, but next round they are going last. This is obviously a lot harder to do on free dice. Um, seven or less on free dice is basically highly improbable. But it does mean that you have a combat control option. Uh, I'm not sure I'm going to use it very much, but it is going to 
encourage me to keep him using the cord staff and not give him any other weapons. This is good because we don't actually get very much by way of weapons or armor in the first few books. I mean, literally, by the end of book three, none of the characters will have upgraded their armor at all. They'll all have the same. They'll all basically have the same starting gear with a few optional extras. Healing. The most important reason for a sage to be in the party. You can use this psionic ability at any time except during combat. When you attempt to heal, you decide how many points of endurance you are going to use. You deduct these from your endurance, then roll one die minus two, and multiply this by the number of points you expended. The result is the healing energy in form of endurance points that you are able to draw from a cosmic flux. These points may be distributed as you wish among the players, including yourself. No player can increase his or her endurance above its initial score, of course. An example will show how this works. Alfred is a sage who decides to expend five endurance in a healing attempt. That's a lot, but I'll get back to that in a bit. He thus rolls one die of minus two and multiplies the figure by five, rolling four on the die, say, and thus getting a total of ten endurance points. He can restore his own endurance to what it was before he tried the healing, and this would still leave him with five points to distribute himself or his companions as he wishes. Negative results on the one die minus two are counted as zero, as mentioned earlier. Your power of healing is always a gamble, though, because you might roll one or two on the die and thus get no points back from a cosmic flux. I think back in the day I worked out that the sweet spot for healing was to spend two endurance because you had a one in three chance of rolling nothing and you'd then need to spend two more endurance just to heal yourself next time. Rolling a three would basically let you shift some of your points to someone else or just heal yourself back up and get nothing. A four or higher would actually give you healing. So you, it's a 50-50 chance of giving healing to the party and a two in three chance of at least getting your own health back. Now, at lower ranks, such as rank one, or t well, as rank two in this case, we're unlikely to be spending two endurance because it's a big risk. Spending one endurance is much more likely. And we can do it at any time except during combat, meaning in a non-combat paragraph, we can just sit there spamming healing until everyone is fairly healthy and we're confident to continue. There, there's no limit of one use per section. Other psionic powers. Your other psionic abilities will be explained in situations where you might need them. They include ESP, that's extrasensory perception, the ability to detect thoughts, paranormal sight, the ability to see through soft materials such as curtains, fog or water, not stone or metal, levitation, the ability to negate the force of gravity on your body, allowing you to rise vertically into the air, only vertically, mind, not horizontally. And exorcism, the ability to dispel ghosts and other wraiths by stifling the paranormal energies that sustain them. These secondary abilities don't get used very often in the series, but they do come up at nice moments. And finally, we have the enchanter or enchantress. Forget the mundane arts of swordplay. You use a sword if you have to, but your true forte is in the manipulation of occult powers of sorcery. So, our rank 2 Enchantress has a fighting prowess of 6, the lowest in the party, a psychic ability of 8, which is a direct counterpart to the warrior's fighting prowess of 8. Deals 1d6 minus 1 damage, so she deals the lowest base damage in the entire party. Has an awareness of 6, which is fairly average. I mean, we got 6, 6, 8, and 6. I think one of these starts to get to a 7 before the others, as they progress. Well, that's just system usage on the uh, program there. Uh, endurance of 10, same as for Sage, although I think she might level up a bit slower over time in terms of endurance, but I'd have to check that. And an armor rating of 2, she has a sword, silver armor, which has virtually no historical precedent, is highly impractical, and it's a miracle that it has an armor rating of 2 and doesn't just break and buckle every time it gets hit. So it's clearly magically heartened, and in this case has lots of tiny little spikes on it. 
and uh, yeah and she's also going to have magic which gets funky and complicated your special skills are more involved than those available to any other character because you have a host of useful and deadly spells at your command. The procedure for spellcasting is quite involved, so read the following stages carefully. Before you can cast a spell, you must call it to mind. If done during a combat, this takes one round. You can call spells to mind at any time and keep them in mind without effort so you may wish to have a few ready before encountering an enemy, rather like having a cocked and loaded crossbow. I have given the tokens a spells prepared space that I can write spells in here. However, each spell that you have in mind temporarily reduces your psychic ability by one until it is cast. If you keep several spells in mind at all times, you will therefore be adventuring with quite a low current psychic ability, and this makes you vulnerable to psychic attacks. The attempt to cast a spell takes one round. It does not happen automatically. In order to cast a spell successfully, you must roll equal to or less than your psychic ability on two dice. You must add a complexity level to the, of the spell to the dice roll. If you fail to cast it, you may try again the next round. This time the roll is easier, as you subtract one from the two dice plus complexity roll. If you fail again, you subtract two from your roll on the next round. If the spellcasting progress is interrupted, for example, you take a round out to dodge or fight, by dodge I mean defend, then you go have to go back to stage one. An example will show how this works. Ragnarok is an enchanter with a psychic ability of nine. He has called two spells to mind in case of trouble, so he currently has a reduced psychic ability score of seven. In an encounter with three goblins, he decides to use his Sheet Lightning spell. This is a complexity level 4 spell, so the first round he tries to cast it, he must roll 7 or less on 2 dice plus 4. He fails this difficulty roll, but continues trying in the next round, this time making 2 dice plus 3. He fails again, so on the third round he needs to make his roll in a seven or of 7 or less on 2 dice plus 2. This time he succeeds, and a crackling bolt scatters the hobgoblins. If Ragnarok had stopped to cast the spell in order to fight and then started trying again the round after that, he would have to start with two dice plus four roll again. The combat spells available to you are as follows. Volcano Spray. Complexity level one causes all enemies in the vicinity to lose one die endurance. This is a blasting spell, so it cannot be resisted. The enemy's armor rating, if any, is deducted from the damage die roll. Night Howl. Complexity level 1. A psychic spell that affects a single opponent. If the opponent fails to resist, he, she, or it must make fight or shoot rolls using one die more than usual. That is on three dice rather than two dice, or four dice if someone is defending. On the For the next four rounds. White fire is complexity level 1. This blasting spell strikes one opponent, causing the loss of two dice plus two endurance, less armor rating. At low rank, that is quite a lot of damage. Uh, useful if we have a hero defending against a monster and then the enchantress blasting it with white fire. Sword Thrust is complexity level 2. A blasting spell affecting one enemy who loses 3 dice plus 3 endurance. Armor reduces for damage in the usual way. The Eye of the Tiger! Complexity level 2. When this spell is cast, you can either add 2 to your fighting prowess and damage rolls, or add 1 to the fighting prowess and damage rolls for everyone in the party, including yourself. That's really good. This lasts for 4 rounds of combat. Immediate Deliverance, complexity level 2. Used during a combat from which you wish to flee, this spell teleports everyone in the party to the exit, if there is one. You are then ready to beat a retreat in the next round. The Mists of Death, complexity level 3. All enemies in the vicinity lose two dice endurance if they fail to resist this psychic spell. Armor gives no protection. The Vampire Spell, originally named there I see. Complexity level 3. This psychic spell can be directed against a single foe who loses four dice endurance if he fails to resist it. Some of the vital energy he loses is channeled into you. Your own endurance is increased by half the amount he loses rounding down. 
Of course, your endurance still cannot exceed its initial score. Sheet Lightning. Complexity level 4. A powerful blasting spell that inflicts 2 dice plus 2 damage to all opponents in the vicinity. Armor protects from this as usual. Ghostly Touch. Complexity level 4. This is the only spell that requires you to be in an adjacent square to your intended victim. It is a psychic spell that affects one opponent who loses 7 dice endurance if he fails to resist it, and 2 dice even if he does resist it. Armor gives no protection. Nemesis Bolt, Complexity Level 5. This highly focused bolt of energy strikes one foe who loses 7 dice plus 7 endurance. It is a blasting spell, so armor will reduce the damage. Servile Enthrallment, Complexity Level 5. This psychic spell affects one enemy. If not resisted, it brings the enemy under your control. He, she, or it simply stops moving and in non-combat situations may respond to your question. If you order an enthralled enemy to fight for you, that is, against his former own former companions, you must roll one die. On a six, he recovers his wits and attacks you. Enthrallment lasts long enough for you to leave the vicinity. So you proceed as though you had slain the opponent in question. I can think of one really tough fight against an undead pirate captain in Book 3 where Servile Enthrallment could actually end the fight pretty quickly. You also have a number of non-combat spells. These include Summon Falcon, which calls a sly fairy creature to serve you for a time, Prediction, which grants a glimpse into possible futures, and Detect Spells, which informs you when magic is operating nearby. There is no need to make dice rolls to cast such spells because it will not usually matter whether it takes several attempts to get them to work. And now we pass on to the adventure itself. Well, I've introduced the heroes, and at this point, looking at the episode length, we are highly unlikely to see combat in this first episode. In fact, I'm going to probably pause when we get to our first fight so that I can set up the battle map in between episodes. I should probably also get a drink soon. How long is this first section? Oh, it's, it's relatively short. Okay, then. Relatively short, he says. <laughs> For the whole day now you have been approaching the smoke columns, rising up vertically hundreds of metres from the flat plains of craft. Metres feel so anachronistic in a medieval fantasy setting, even if you are playing RuneQuest. The sky above is blue, cloudless and cold. A bitter wind blows across the dry, sear grass of the marshes and sluggish ripples through the puddles of mire which occupy the low ground. The monotony of the landscape is broken only by the occasional stunted willow growing by black muddy pools and mares. Calogun's Keep is a monolithic black citadel looming ahead of you. Hoping to reach its gates before nightfall, you curse the throng of peasants and merchants milling towards it. You jostle through them towards the citadel, this morning just an imperceptible speck across the black wastes, but now a monstrous edifice that seems to fill the horizon. You know you have only until tomorrow to find a sponsor among the Magi of Craft, for tomorrow battle will be unleashed in the pits beneath the citadel. Fame and fortune go to the adventurer. To the adventure sorry, fame and fortune go to the adventurers and their sponsors who return from the labyrinth fine battle pits of with the emblem of victory. If you find no Magus who is prepared to sponsor you this time, you will have to wait another long year for the next contest. A year through which the marsh waters will rise, drowning the land and the causeways leading to the citadel, rendering Calogun's keep impregnable. No one enters or leaves in that time except the Magi on their flying carpets, and only a mid-year can the citizens emerge to sow their fields with corn and rice before the harsh winter months begin again. At last you manage to break through the gabbling crowds of the baggage train and ride under the grey blocks of the massive gate, its portcullis open like the moors of a hungry god. 
The dour streets are festooned with the flags of the Magi, for one week in the year, when this grim place is ablaze with colour. You were, sorry, for one week in the year, when this grim place is, awry with co is ablaze with colour, you reflect wryly. The strange cries call out the glories of their lords. In the central square, you see a booth where the Magi's stewards are registering the combatants whom their masters have employed for tomorrow's contest. Each hero, or group of heroes, must take their sponsor's pennant with them into the battle fits. Battle pi Battle fits! Blah! Battle pits. But as you scan the ranks outside the booth, you see that only three pennants remain. Three stewards stand by the pennants. Three Magi seek champions. The stewards grin sourly as they see you eyeing the pennants. Over the years, they must have engaged dozens of brave adventurers on their respective master's behalf. And how many of those adventurers went down in the battle pits never to emerge? You scowl back at them grimly, but they only smile the broader. They know you must choose one of the pennants. As you debate for choice, an old merchant wrapped in greasy furs, and obviously the worse for drink, sees you contemplating the booth. If you ignore the drunken merchant and go over to the booth... Hang on. 10, 10, 4, 5, 2. If you talk to the merchant... I think we could talk to the merchant and find out what he has to say. If there is a trickster in your group and he or she wishes to act, oh, this is an opportunity to rob the merchant, isn't it? If a sage wishes to try something, or the enchanter wishes to try something, we have respective options available. You know what? I think I'm going to end the episode here. There's uh, some interesting choices. I'm thinking if I talk to the merchant, hopefully some of the other choices will be available. Uh, sage or the enchanter? Uh, so the enchanter might know something about the penance of the, of the magi. Might know their... Um, their their reputations might know, oh, this is a kind wizard, or this is one who's rather nasty or greedy and is just going to abuse us. Um, the sage will have some kind of knowledge that can be applied here. Uh, the trickster is likely to just be robbing someone. Um, let me know in the comments section down below what you think I should do. I mean, I'm going to make my own mind up, obviously. I'm not going to necessarily do what I'm told. But hey, let's uh, let's see. Okay, guys, um, that's probably been long enough for one episode. I hope you all enjoyed this one, and I will look forward to seeing you all in the next one. I'm going to say bye-bye for now, and cheerio!